Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a glass of sangria. What are you having, Jenny? Today, I'm drinking some peach wine. On this week's episode, we're exploring the notorious Jonestown Massacre led by Jim Jones, leader of the People's Temple. Before we get started, we wanted to let everyone know this episode will include discussion of suicide. Jim Jones was born on May 13, 1931, in Crete, Indiana. As a child, Jim was an avid churchgoer and preached to children in his community. Jones was a strong student known for his public speaking skills, but he did not have many friends. One friend he did have, however, remembered Jones being a quote-unquote really weird kid. He was obsessed with death and religion. At the age of 21, he decided to enter the ministry. In June 1949, he married his wife Marceline, and they went on to adopt several children of various racial and ethnic backgrounds. He referred to them as his quote-unquote rainbow family and would later use the term in reference to his religious followers. Jones gained a following in the 50s and 60s and was known for his charisma and healing abilities. He claimed he could heal the sick and that he held psychic powers. He was also interested in holding racially integrated services, but his church in a predominantly white neighborhood in Indiana did not agree. During this time, he was also noted for his work with the homeless, and in the early 1960s, he served as director of Indianapolis's Human Rights Commission. Jones then branched out on his own, forming the Wings of Deliverance Pentecostal Church in 1955, which would later become known as the People's Temple. To help build his following, He bought time on local AM radio stations to air his sermons. Fearing nuclear war, Jones moved his family and following to Northern California in 1965. An estimated 70 to 100 church members accompanied Jones to California. They lived in the remote small towns of Ukiah and Redwood Valley. The church even had a pet chimpanzee that was named Mr. Muggs. Jones claimed he had rescued Mr. Muggs from scientific experiments, though according to Jeff Gwynn's The Road in Jonestown, Jones may have actually purchased Muggs from a pet store. The People's Temple followers were diverse in age and race and preached what many would call unconventional socialist and progressive ideas. By the early 1970s, Jones had expanded his recruitment efforts and started preaching in San Francisco, eventually opening a new branch of his church there. Jones was a prominent political figure in San Francisco. He moved into the Fillmore District, the city's most devastated black neighborhood, at its most vulnerable moment. Because of his following, liberal politicians saw Jones as a potentially game-changing ally in their long battle to take over City Hall. Followers helped elect George Moscone as San Francisco mayor, and Jim Jones made sure that Moscone never forgot his political debt to the People's Temple. Jones hoped to create a racial utopia and a peaceful world with the help of his followers. In reality, Jones maintained a racial hierarchy within the organization. While church membership was primarily Black, the 37-member planning commission, which Jones called his leadership council, was dominated by white women. His Black adopted son, Jim Jones Jr., has said, quote, When people talk about my father manipulating Black people, that's true. It was politically advantageous for him to give me his name, end quote. Not only did his followers fall for his talk of a better life, many surrendered their savings and paychecks to Jones, who began calling himself the prophet. Before long, he began to face various allegations, most notably that he was illegally diverting the income of cult members for his own use. As part of his teachings, Jones discouraged sex and romantic relationships. However, he did not practice what he preached and had several adulterous relationships with some of his male and female followers, including one of the church administrators, Caroline Layden, with whom he had a son. In 1974, Jones brought land in Guyana, a state in northern South America, to develop into a new home for himself and his followers. He had become increasingly paranoid from media scrutiny and moved the People's Temple's compound, known as Jonestown, there with about a thousand people. 
Jonestown was initially called an agricultural experiment. Jones's mission there was to build a utopia where people of all races could live and work communally. Jones ran the compound like a prison camp and confiscated people's passports and manipulated his followers with threats of blackmails, beatings, and probable death. His followers received little food and weren't allowed to leave the compound. Armed guards stood at the compound's perimeters as well. Jones often preached over the loudspeaker system at Jonestown. Fearful of a plot against him, he started conducting suicide drills. This included his followers being woken up in the middle of the night. They would receive a cup with a red liquid that they were told contained poison, which they were ordered to drink. After 45 minutes or so, the members were told that they were not going to die and that they had just passed a loyalty test. Concern over the welfare of those in the encampment prompted U.S. Congressman Leo Ryan to visit Jonestown in 1978. Ryan became involved in the People's Temples issue after hearing his constituents' concerns that their relatives were possibly being held against their will in Jonestown. Former People's Temple member Grace Stowen had been asking the government to help her regain custody of her son, John Victor, who Jones claimed to have fathered and whom she had left behind in 1976 out of fear that her life and John's were in danger. Jones adamantly refused to hand him over despite court orders that he must do so. Another ex-member of the group, Deborah Blakely, had also spoken out publicly against Jones. Ryan wrote a letter to Jim Jones requesting an invitation to visit the settlement, a move that Jones and his followers vehemently opposed, but to which they later agreed. On November 18, 1978, Ryan toured Jonestown with the television crew in tow. Followers cheered and Jones said that the members were free to come and go as they pleased. However, Jonestown followers began passing notes to Ryan's team saying that they wanted to leave but could not. They shared stories of physical and sexual abuse and mind control with the journalists. Ryan invited anyone who wanted to leave the compound to come with him, but his rescue operation did not go as planned. That afternoon, Ryan's group and 15 people temple defectors were driven to an airstrip in Port Catatuma. They were attacked by people temple's guardsmen sent by Jones. Ryan, three journalists, and one defector were killed while others were injured. Worried that those who had escaped would bring in the authorities, a prescription drug-addicted Jones launched into what he called his quote-unquote revolutionary suicide campaign where he urged followers to commit suicide or else the Guyanese military would come in and take their children away. Cyanide and Valium were mixed into a batch of grape-flavored powder punch mix, which Jones ordered his followers to drink. The majority obeyed his command. Children were the first to die, and those who refused to drink were forced by armed guards. Jones died of a gunshot wound to the head, which was possibly self-inflicted. He was found on the floor of the Jonestown Pavilion, the camp's main gathering area, with his wife Marceline, nurse Annie Moore, and other top group members. Guyanese troops reached Jonestown the next day. In total, 900 people were found dead, including 304 who were under the age of 18. Amid the hundreds of deaths, there were a number of survivors in Jonestown. On the morning of November 18, 1978, hours before the dramatic events unfolded, a group of 11 Temple members, including a mother and her three-year-old son, walked 35 miles to escape under the pretense of going to a picnic. Two men, Stanley Clayton and Odell Rhodes, were able to bypass armed security through a combination of luck and deception. Three other Temple members... Mike Prokes and brothers Tim and Mike Carter were sent out on a mission by Jim Jones's aide to deliver a suitcase of money to the Soviet embassy. There were many followers at the Temple Outpost in Georgetown, Guyana, and the church's San Francisco headquarters who didn't heed Jim Jones's suicide order. Hyacinth Thrash, an elderly African-American woman, slept inside her cabin throughout the whole ordeal. She woke up the following morning and walked over to a senior citizen's building where she saw bodies covered in sheets. Her sister was among the dead. In his memory, Leo Ryan received a Congressional Gold Medal in 1983, and a post office in his old district of San Mateo, California, was named after him in 2009. 
Until the September 11th attacks, the tragedy in Jonestown represented the largest number of American civilian casualties in a single non-natural event. Del, what are your thoughts on Jonestown and Jim Jones? So my thoughts on Jim Jones is that he is one of the most evil people to ever exist. And the fact that he was able to convince so many people that he was a prophet and he was someone that wanted for the betterment of other people, it's so sad. Because his followers thought that they would have a better life. They thought that they were going to be free from the oppression around him when instead they just found another form of oppression under him. And when it comes to Jonestown, it is one of those events where you stop and think of, like, how could that have been prevented? Is it the responsibility of Guyana? Should they have done more to not only protect Congressman Ryan, but also maybe more check-ins on what Jones was doing. I know a lot of things that I've read was that Jones picked that place specifically because he felt like he wasn't going to get as much pushback. I personally think that Jonestown was definitely an example of what happens when you put all your faith and trust into the wrong person. And into a person that only has their own self-gratification at the heart of everything that they do. Jim Jones definitely wasn't the only cult leader that made it so that his own sexual gratification came above everything else. And when you mix in his drug use, I can definitely see the level of control that he probably had over his followers who feared both the physical retaliation of going against him and the sexual retaliation of going against Jim Jones. I do think that the majority of people committed suicide willingly. I think that Jones had a unique spell on people and that once he gave the order, most people were giving it to their children first and then to themselves. I'm not going to go too deep into it now. I know that that's something that we're going to talk about a little later, but all around Jonestown is definitely one of the biggest tragedies in American history. What are your thoughts on it? I think a lot of people don't realize that it is one of the biggest tragedies. And researching Jonestown for me was a lot more emotional than I thought it would be. I have so much sympathy for the victims and survivors because I really do think that they were well-intentioned people who, kind of like you said, they got led astray. And I think they were really more intelligent than a lot of people give them credit for. I mean, the stories of survival are so incredible and terrifying, and I don't know how people have the strength and the courage to do what they did. Jim Jones is evil. He's sick. He's a master manipulator. And I wonder if he ever did have good intentions because he sounds like he was always weird. He always needed attention from what I've heard. I mean, it kind of sucks because like we're never going to forget his name and I'm sure, you know, he would like that. But I hope that this can just be like some kind of cautionary tale, which we're going to talk about too, because again, these people really were well-intentioned. And I think it's so fascinating hearing them speak and all of the guilt that some of these people have had. It's heartbreaking. Despite the large death count, like we said, there are a number of survivors of both the Jonestown Massacre and defectors of the People's Temple. People were really attracted to the church's progressive ideas and their emphasis on activism. The People's Temple was described as a melting pot because all people were welcome. And these devoted and hardworking people performed altruistic deeds for the community, and some of them had their lives turned around by getting off of drugs and crime. Another reason we say that Jim Jones is a manipulator is because he gets a lot of credit for, you know, doing a lot for the community, which I'm sure he did to an extent. But from what I've heard, it really was more of his followers that were doing a lot of the work and helping him get that reputation. People have said he made us feel special, like something bigger than ourselves. Total equality, no rich or poor, no races. We were alive in those services. They had life, soul, and power. Jim Jones was described as seeing himself following in the footsteps of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, leading, quote-unquote, his people out of bondage and into the promised land. Laura Johnston Cole, another former Temple member, said, quote, We, all of us, were doing the right things, but in the wrong place with the wrong leader. We all thought that we were a family rather than a church. 
survivor Leslie Wagner Wilson, who has done different interviews, has said that she remembers Jim Jones as a charismatic and frightening leader. And Wagner Wilson also lost her husband and several family members in the Jonestown Massacre. In a TV interview, she said Jones felt trapped at Jonestown because there were no politicians or people giving him accolades, and because of that, he started discussing his revolutionary suicide idea. And his preaching at the time, she remembers, turned into Jones asking for pity and sympathy from his followers because part of this lack of attention and need for validation, which is so disgusting to see. Many followers and former members initially struggled to restart their lives and unfortunately several met tragic fates. Newspapers that reported on the mass death were brutal and unkind to People Temple's members. Mike Prop, the Temple's media relations person who escaped death in Jonestown, eventually died by suicide. Husband and wife Al and Jeannie Mills, who were prominent defectors and opponents of Jones, were found murdered at their Berkeley, California home in 1980, a crime that has remained unsolved. These are just two examples, but there are many other members who are currently incarcerated for severe crimes or have been murdered. Today, the legacy of Jonestown has pretty much been reduced to the expression, drinking the Kool-Aid. Drinking the Kool-Aid refers to those who blindly and foolishly follow something. But it wasn't actual Kool-Aid that was used in the suicides, but rather a similar brand called Flavor Aid. The reference of Kool-Aid could be traced to the early reporting in the days after the tragedy, such as an article in the Washington Post. Today, the phrase has mixed, even offensive meanings to temple survivors and relatives. Wanell Smart, whose four children, mother, and uncle died in the tragedy, said, quote, I hated that people laughed when they said it, like what happened was somehow funny, end quote. Survivor Mike Carter said he was deeply offended when he heard the remarks, saying, I thought, how can these people trivialize such a horrific event as the mass murder-suicide of over 900 people? The world viewed the victims of Jonestown as fanatics and not as real people. Dr. Phyllis Deal, a sociology and psychology professor at Texarkana College, said, quote, For people to say, oh, they drank the Kool-Aid, they were just stupid cult followers, it makes it easier to just dismiss the whole thing. It's just so we can feel better. But we're doing people a grave disservice by trying to imply that all the killings happen for the same reason, end quote. Del, have your thoughts on the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid changed at all? I think I've always had trouble with the phrase. And then as I've gotten older, I've had a better understanding of why the phrasing always didn't sit right with me. I think that I definitely agree with survivors when they say that it just trivializes what happens. It makes it seem like they deserved it. Like, oh, you were drinking the Kool-Aid. It's your fault. This was something that you willingly did. And, you know, even if they willingly actually drank the flavor aid in this case, it's not accounting for the psychological and physical damage that was done by the cult. And it minimizes them to just mindless horde who simply were infatuated with this man. And I think it also reduces the evilness of Jim Jones because it's not that people were manipulated or people were tricked. It was that they were just blindly following. It was that they didn't do enough research and that was not the case when it comes to Jim Jones and the Jonestown Massacre. What are your thoughts on it? So mine are a little different because I really never gave the term much thought, but I definitely now understand why survivors and family members are upset by people saying it, and I totally support them in that. It does make light of the situation. There's no denying it. I think it also kind of takes the blame off of Jim Jones and really puts it onto the people themselves. And like you were saying, you can't ignore the manipulation and the power dynamics that he was using. And I think that when you compare it to 9-11, the number is really astonishing and it puts things into perspective because you wouldn't dare like make fun of 9-11 or the people that went to work that day. If we're going to use the term drink the Kool-Aid, we should use it to encourage people to be mindful of what they believe and follow and that it should be a statement of a cautionary tale and to just 
ask questions some more. And like you said, like don't blindly follow. And as we're going to get into it, some people did that. Some people did ask questions, but some people also did whatever Jim wanted. With all of that being said, that leads us to the question, was Jonestown a mass suicide or a mass murder? While the general view of what happened was a mass suicide because people lined up to take the poison drink, there have been arguments from witnesses and former temple members that it was really a mass murder. Dr. Phyllis Steele said, quote, everyone died for a different reason. Some of the adults believed in Jim Jones's cause and followed him to the end. Others were miserable living in the compound and just wanted everything to be over. So with that being said, let's get into arguments for why it is mass murder versus why it could be mass suicide. So for mass murder, there were armed guards surrounding the compound that ensured no one would get out alive. Some victims were found with marks on their bodies suggesting that they were injected with the poison and syringes were also found at the compound which supports this theory. CNN discovered that Jones had been stockpiling cyanide in 1976 before a majority of the followers even moved to Guyana, and he created paranoia and made people practice suicide drills frequently. And of course, we have to mention children who did not understand what they were doing died at the hands of their parents. We would both agree that that, the children were all murdered there. I think most people would agree with that. Tim Reederman, who, as a reporter for the San Francisco Examiner, was injured during the shooting attack on Congressman Ryan at the airstrip, said, quote, Jones put all the pieces in place for a last act of self-destruction, then gave the order to kill the children first, sealing everyone's fate, end quote. Tim Carter, who did escape Jonestown but lost his wife and baby son, also agrees that it was a mass murder. He said Jones was going to kill everybody no matter what. There were so many lies that Jones told people to create a state of siege mentality in the community, that even those that were making a principled stand on revolutionary suicide probably were influenced a lot by the lies that he was telling them. And finally, California Congresswoman Jackie Speer, who was an aide to Leo Ryan and was shot during the Jonestown airstrip attack, agrees that it was mass murder and that the members weren't, quote unquote, willingly taking their lives. So to support the theory that this was a mass suicide, author Dr. John Hall said, quote, to say everyone was murdered denies the agency and the solidarity of these people, end quote. He went on to say, quote, the adults at Jonestown lived within their own bubble of reality, and in the end, they had come to believe that their world was under siege from the outside, end quote. Again, as we talked about, people lined up and willingly poisoned themselves and their children. A letter attributed to Richard Troop read, quote, if nobody understands, it matters not. I am ready to die now. Darkness settles over Jonestown on its last day on earth, end quote. However, some survivors remember Troop arguing with Jones about the plan being a bad idea. In the end, experts who study Jonestown agreed that the deaths were neither wholly suicide nor wholly an act of murder, but instead a little of both. What do you think, Del? Was Jonestown a mass murder, mass suicide, or was it both like the experts say? I definitely agree with the experts on this, that there was a combination. As I was stating before, I think that the children were definitely murdered. And I think that while, yes, the parents and the adults in general were manipulated by Jones, I do think that they willingly killed themselves because they wanted to stay as a part of the group. They didn't want to be the person within the group that didn't go through with the prophet's orders. The brainwashing was so strong that Jones could have said anything. He could have said, I want you guys to kill each other. And I think that a good portion of people would have done it. But I do think that there were acts of murder outside of the murdering of the children. I do think that there was an insurance policy in place for the armed guards to kill those that did not want to go through with the initial plan. 
Now, I can't say for sure what percentage was suicide versus murder, but I do think that there was at least some fraction of people that were murdered for refusing to actually drink the poison. I do find it curious that all reports are that the upper echelon of Jonestown actually died via self-inflicted gunshot wounds versus the poison. And so my thinking on that is they died that way because they died later than the other people. They wanted to make sure as many people were dead as possible and then as the armed forces of Guyana were approaching they were like okay well this is it for us and then they killed themselves at that point which one do you think it is Jenny mass murder mass suicide combination I think it's a combination it's clear like we've been saying that people were manipulated and that Jim wanted everyone dead really to save his ass I agree that it it does take away people's agency when we say it's mass murder, even though we are basically confirming, like, they made a bad decision, but it was their own free will that they made that decision with. But it's clear that it wasn't the case for some people, especially with the syringes, too. That was used for people, I think for some children, but also people, adults, that didn't want to drink the flavor aid. Everyone was going down one way or another. It's clear that was his plan. He was going to do whatever he had to. The amount of paranoia he put in these people is... It's nice to see that experts do have a nuanced look at it. Because it is true. Like we said, some people clearly followed Jim to their death. Because they felt so strongly about him or were just so scared of him. But then there were other people who did go down, I guess, with a fight. They needed the syringes for them. I think some people were also maybe shot as well. I don't think everyone died from the poisoning. It's awful to see that Jim had a quick death, whether he shot himself or someone else shot him. It's rumored that his nurse could have shot him because I believe she also had a gunshot wound. All 900 of those people suffered. I don't think it was a quick death from what I've heard. That agony is just so upsetting to think about. I definitely agree with Dr. Deal who says that everyone died for a different reason because like she said some people just weren't happy living there and they maybe were depressed and this was their way out of their depression and their living situation but other people whatever Jim promised for them maybe in this afterlife after they drank the poison that's what they wanted that's what their you know heart was set on. It's important to have these types of discussions and to look at it like this because history is never really black or white one thing or the other. It's nuanced and it's very complex. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Jim Jones and the People's Temple and if we should cover some more cults. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the monster with 21 faces. As always, stay safe.